Welcome back to NPTEL, the National Program on Technology Enhanced Learning being brought to you by the Indian Institutes of Technology and the Indian Institute of Science. We have completed one module in our series of lectures collectively entitled English Language and Literature. In the last module, we uh, had talked about several things and among them the important uh, point that I would like to reiterate is that this course is meant primarily for students in various engineering colleges um, in India uh, for whom it is necessary to have a basic knowledge okay, of English as um, a language of communication. Along with it, it is also important that they know or they are acquainted with English literature okay, and some aspects of literary theory and the English language. Okay. So, with that view, we talked about several things really in our first module. Okay. We talked about um, the scope of English studies. Uh, we, there is a transition being made from uh, English as understood, okay, as hitherto understood and now we talk also about or largely sorry about English studies which also comprises not just English as it is understood, spoken, uh, the literatures of England, but also English as it is spoken, understood and its literatures in various parts of the world, not necessarily also only in the commonwealth nations. We also spoke about uh, the alchemy of English okay, when we based our lecture on uh, the work done by Professor Braj Kachru. We also looked at the importance of cultural study. So, what I am going to do here in the first you know uh, the first few minutes of this lecture, uh, we are going to do a recap okay, of some of the things that we did in our last module. We saw that for instance, when we talk about the scope of English studies, we include broadly speaking three areas okay, and these areas are literatures in English. Okay. Remember, we are not saying English literature, we are saying literatures in English, right? English linguistics and English sociolinguistics. Now, these are by no means the only three domains which comprise the scope of English studies, but I, I had um, asserted in that particular lecture that these are nevertheless the core areas okay, that we need to look at when we talk about. Um, the scope of English studies. Then further we found that when we do courses on English studies or English language and literature, they are now increasing in emphasis put on or, or laid on areas such as journalism, the philosophy of language in general, literary theory and criticism, creative writing, electronic texts and publishing and hypertext, film and media and communication. So, the study of language particularly uh, as in our case the English language okay, does not stop only at literatures, uh, does not stop uh, uh, at sociolinguistics etcetera, but also kind of percolates down to associated or kindred domains like journalism, media studies, even the philosophy of language follow okay, communication and electronic public publishing. Right? So, these are the things that we found in our lecture on the scope of English studies. Then we also found uh, very importantly that there is one uh, domain or sub domain okay, uh, which we should not leave though uh, leave out at least in our discussion of the scope of the study of English. Okay. We do not have discussions on those areas which are uh, uh, are, are uh, largely to do with proficiency. 
okay, in the English language and for instance English for special purposes and the use of English as a second language. Okay. So, these are not being brought here because there are also as far as proficiency is concerned on the use of English for special purposes etcetera are concerned or for, in for, for very important issues like communicating okay, better communication in English is concerned. Uh, you will have you just need to go to the NPTEL website to find that there are a few courses at least a couple of courses okay, which address these very important needs in students. So, this part we are leaving out from our program or sorry from our course. Then we oh, had also one uh, we had one devoted one lecture to world Englishes. Okay. And we found that when we talk about world Englishes, there are it is not just a matter of you know um, accepting the fact that there are different variants of English all over the world. Okay. The, the idea of a Queen's English or a standard English which was so as we will find was so important okay, uh, as far as say early modern English was concerned uh, in, in Britain. Um, in this case really there, there is a uh, political need okay, to, uh, to recognize the existence of several Englishes, right? Uh, so much so that we do not use the word word English or phrase word English, we use the phrase word Englishes. And here in this slide, let us uh, look at this slide, we found that the, the whole issue of uh, world Englishes has to be uh, addressed as far as at least six areas are concerned and these areas are the history of English in different parts of the you know uh, in the different parts of the world and we have in fact the last lecture in the current module okay is uh, also takes a historical look at english in india right so we have also the use of english in diasporas then variations of world englishes the whole the whole uh, you know phenomenon of acculturation of English and to English, okay, the issue of creativity and the changing of the language as far as creative texts are concerned. And finally, and not the least the most important of them all according to me is the question of ideology. Okay. Uh, ideology means a, uh, you know the way you perceive the world, okay. it is like you could say a set of lenses through which you perceive the world. Okay. So, these are some of the things we found that the world, world English is, is not just about uh, studying different variants of English, but also their histories, their ideologies, etc. Okay, so so this is what we did in the lecture on world Englishes. Then we found also that there are other issues as far as English studies goes, and these are to do with the whole idea of you know the issue of unity and commonality among the various world Englishes. Okay and how uh, different there are different instances of uh, you know other uh, non uh, 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 non uh, native english speakers in trying to resist what they feel is a sort of depersonalization that occurs with uh, you know the um, with an unproblematic acceptance or embrace so to speak of english Okay. Uh, this is addressed also by linguists with a post colonial orientation. Okay. They also talk about uh, how for instance, um, you can look up uh, the, the, uh, the um, Algerian activist Franz Fanon for instance okay, and he talks about what happens to language as far as you know um, uh, in this case this is French okay, as far as uh, blacks embrace you know uh, emulating uh, the French language when they go to France okay, is concerned fine. Then also reworkings how Englishes are English or Englishes rework okay, the language and also concurrently the whole project uh, entirely different project of trying to restore okay, in non native English speak, uh, speaking countries trying to restore the various indigenous if I may use the word or vernacular again if I may use the word uh, languages in their respective countries. And finally, also the whole question of modernity okay, does speaking uh, English also mean modernity, does it mean that we take its concepts and does it make it more. Now, these are really hugely again. Uh, I would say contentious issues, many scholars have many things to say about these, but we brought this up in the last um, uh, you know last lecture 
sorry last module just to give you an idea of how many things uh, how many uh, problematic things come into our discussion of world Englishes. Then we all we had one lecture on the rise of cultural studies in uh, the study of English language and literature and the study of English studies right. And then we um, uh, refer to a quotation from uh, the, uh, the cultural studies uh, the well known cultural studies scholar Chris Barker. And let us look at the slide here ok. Barker in his book making sense of cultural studies may, uh, has this to say that the machinery and operations of language ok. The machinery and opera operations of language are central concerns and ok problems for cultural studies. Right? Indeed, the investigation of culture has often been regarded as virtually interchangeable with the exploration of meaning produced symbolically through signifying systems that work like a language. Now, the as we saw in the last um, uh, module, I think the rise of cultural studies was the last lecture in that module. Okay, so how looking at entire cultures as systems that uh, that kind of uh, from where meanings are uh, meanings emanate right, right how we also read cultures like languages do you understand so if one language uh, you know has certain symbols in which which you arrange in certain ways cultures are also seen as symbolically constituted as if they were languages okay so we also looked at this uh, part uh, or you know or this aspect new relatively new aspect of the rise of cultural studies as far as um, English studies is concerned. Then uh, we also talked about discourses ok how this you know how languages are uh, not just English languages are in general they are discourses right. Uh, languages are discourses in the sense that they are objects they are structured systems within which your utterances are valid or invalid ok. Languages are also ideological systems and languages are texts. Th this is what we found in our again in our lecture I, uh, like lecture on uh, the rise of cultural, uh, cultural studies fine. So, today's lecture is an uh, it is almost it is like an overview of what we are going to do in the next 5 4 or 5 lectures ok. So, it is an overview of this module uh, it is entitled um, it is an introduction to the history of uh, the English language ok. And uh, I will run you through some of the ma major things that we are going to talk about in the history you know in the various historical periods as far as the English language is concerned ending with English in India. Uh, but at I would like to say make one thing clear at this point and which is that you know it is impossible to talk about everything ok regarding the history of a language you know when they it is packed into just a couple of lectures ok. So, I would urge you those of you who may be interested in any one phase or interested in any one aspect ok to go and look up some of the books that we shall be mentioning in you know uh, during our lectures ok. Here essentially what my my uh, approach would be is to relate you know uh, first is to tell you let you know about certain changes in the English language is very basic ok. And then to show you how changes in language do not happen in a vacuum, they do not occur in a vacuum ok. There are definite social, economic and political cultural factors which uh, determine ok or at least which influence changes in a language and also may you know language change changes those changes again sort of you know uh, in some so sort of a feedback loop again change you know uh, uh, influencing the social social cultural economic movements ok of societies right. So, this is one of the things that I will try and bring to you because it is very important for us uh, and we call this method uh, more or less a diachronic method. Diachronic means chrono is time ok. So, over time. So, this is over time how language you know a particular language has changed. So, please remember that as I said there are many way, different ways in which you can teach or you can learn about the history of the English language and I also urge you to go through there are many other 
um, you know such presentations on YouTube, there are many uh, HTML files available on the net. So, you want to you know enrich yourself after having been through these basic lectures. Okay. So, English is as we saw I think in one uh, in a lecture on uh, on introducing the English language per se, I think it was in volume uh, sorry in module 1, I think there was a lecture on yes the English language this is um, module 1 uh, lecture 3, you could go back to that okay, and then uh, try and connect that lecture from you know the first module to, to all the lectures in this module. Okay. So, there we had found if you look at this slide, slide here that English belongs to the Indo-European family of languages, it belongs particularly to it comes from the anglo frisian dialects. It comes finally, to us from West Germanic right. So, this we, we first we place um, a, you know English, we do not have English as we have it in the modern form today, we did not have English in the history of English, we know that we did not have English in the form that we have today. Today's English is modern English, it is uh, many would say global English. right? So, we will see how English develops, okay, belongs to a certain family of languages and the reasons why and we will begin with the period old English. So, just uh, quickly about again the status of English, English is the official language in 51 countries according to sources and substantial native English speakers are found in 104 countries. It is the third most spoken language and there are more than 600 million people okay, who use English as a second or as a third language. Okay. So, we talked about the proliferation of English over the globe and we just provided some statistics in our lecture on the English language in the last module. So, uh, again as always let us declare the text from where we shall be taking our points and these are AC balls, a history of the English language, Charles Barber's the English language, a historical introduction in Indrani Ghosh's edited volume history of English language, a critical companion. Now, it is not necessary that these are the only texts that you need uh, to consult, you can always have different sets of books, but I thought that it was important for us to kind of zoom in on a few texts, so, so as to have some sort of a guide and also as you know some sort of a reference instead of bringing points from all various you know books or uh, once uh, one point from a single book and have, you know it is always better for us to stick to a, uh, a limited number of books when you talk about. Of course, uh, time and again I shall be referring to other texts and I shall mention the names and authors of those texts. As always I shall also have uh, you know occasion when I shall uh, occasion to read extracts sometimes may be long extracts from certain texts and in that as far as academic um, ethics goes, I shall every time declare that I am reading from this particular source. Okay. So, English when you, go, when you look at the history of uh, the English language, okay, we need to divide the history of English into three or four major, okay, very major periods of uh, the language okay. and, and the first period is known as old English right, which came about you know which is the language that came about after and we can say because of the conquest of uh, England by marauding tribes. Okay. These tribes are known as the Angles, the Saxons and the Jutes. Now, these are the places where they came from. Okay. They, the Jutes came from Jutland, Saxons from Holstein, Angles from Schleswig and finally, the name English can be if you look at the slide, the name English comes from one of the name of one of the tribes known as the Angles. Okay. Now, from Angles we have the name England. Okay. Engel and finally, English right. So, these were the old, older spellings and finally, we had the word or term English right. So, they were remember they were the old English period is inaugurated by the three marauding tribes that came from various parts of uh, you know on uh, of Europe uh, from and settled in England right, replacing the older language, pushing the older language into 
areas like Cornwall, Wales and Scotland. Right? Now, more, uh, more details are to be found in the next lecture in, these, in this module which is on Old English. Now, the characteristics of Old English, one of the first things that you note is the spelling and pronunciation of Old English. Okay? Pronunciation of Old English words differs from that of their obviously from their modern equivalents. Again, I would urge you maybe to go to you know Google images or go to various sites on the net or even if you get these on books in books to see how now for copyright reasons I have not brought those images here, but you uh, can uh, you know any text Beowul for instance okay, is going to you have an idea of how different the pronunciation and spelling uh, was okay, even some of the letters okay, as far as old English the difference between old English and modern English is concerned. Now, there was absence from words derived from Latin or French largely and the, the grammar is different the old English is synthetic, but modern English is an analytic language more about this in our uh, next lecture. Now, the distinction of course, of number of singular plural and case the grammatical gender was not dependent upon considerations of sex very important. Okay. For example, uh, Mona moon is masculine okay. uh, make then girl right with that is wife and child that is child are neuter. Okay. We understand woman in modern English as being a feminine gender, okay. but there was a great difference when you compare modern English and uh, old English in terms of grammar and particularly in terms of um, gr uh, grammatical gender. Then the two very important texts in old English are a Beowulf which is a folk epic okay, and the seafarer which is a monologue. And as Bo A. C. Bo who is one of the uh, you know source texts here. Uh, remarks the literature of the Anglo Saxons is fortunately one of the richest and most significant of any preserved among the early tutors. Beowulf now is, is available um, uh, has been available for a long time. Okay. So, again those of you who are interested may want to just have a look at the kind of writing and language you find there even though obviously it will be very difficult for you to understand uh, the language or that version of English unless you are trained to read that. We also have translations and books under King Alfred, then uh, we have the tragedy the wanderer war poems uh, you know uh, in for instance Anglo Saxon literature um, is considered to be one of uh, one among the richer phases of English. Okay. So, next uh, in this journey of uh, you know the history of English language we move on to another another um, uh, another phase which is known as middle English and we move we have moved over from old English to middle English which is uh, generally considered to be even there are slight differences in date regarding scholars this left usually understood to be within 11 uh, uh, 150 to 1500. Okay. So, middle English really had different dialects by the time you can imagine uh, the, the Anglo Saxon was uh, language English as in through Anglo Saxon was established and now there grew to be different dialects. Okay. So, by the time it is middle English that is from 1150 onwards we find that there are at least 4 major dialects here and these are the northern dialect going by their geographical areas, the northern dialect, the east midland dialect, west midland dialect and southern dialect. Okay, dialect. We find, find later on that east midland begins to get gain more prominence uh, you know uh, in, in, in another say 100 years. Okay. Now, uh, again we we'll let us quote from Charles Barber okay, read from an extract from Charles Barber whose text on the on the history of the English language is another text with us. Okay. He talks about uh, the Norman conquest the Norman conquest which marks okay, the beginning of middle English right the Norman French conquest. Okay, for which this is one date from which we can we can you know um, we can mark a separate two periods in uh, the history of English language. Okay, he says old English. Uh, now again, you see whenever we demarcate historical periods, okay, it is it would be sort of naive on our part to think that 
uh, historical periods are watertight okay that when you say end of old english with the coming of the norman french that old english completely disappears and you know is replaced by middle english it is not so obviously there are percolations okay there are remnants even as in an earlier age there may be you know some hints or glimmerings of a new language a new variant of a language emerging so let's uh, read what charles barber says charles barber is one of you know pioneering again with ac bo one of the pioneering uh, figures in this in the study of english uh, the history of the english language now this is what he has to say let's look at this slide old english did not disappear overnight at the norman conquest nor did it immediately stop being written for the west saxon literary tradition was continued for a time in some of the great monasteries but in the years following the conquest changes which had already begun to show themselves in pre conquest this is and this is exactly what i said ki the glimmerings of changes may be seen may have been seen even before uh, an age is said to have you know followed by another one he says here let's look at this slide but in the years following the conquest changes which had already begun to show themselves in pre conquest old english continued at an increased speed and in less than a century we can say that the old english period is over and that middle english has begun the point is when we read history not necessarily the history of a language when we read any kind of history it is important for us to to realize that there are transitional periods these transitional periods are as important as the so called main you know chief full bloom periods with you know where we have uh, in a way the language shows the different qualities okay at its peak uh, these transitional periods are also important and need to be taken into consideration each period in history has right elements from the older period and elements from the newer period which form these important transitional phases now the norman following the norman conquest the middle english period is you know also considered to be a period of great change okay of great importance uh, and there was a continuation as we saw the tendencies have begun to manifest themselves in old english and uh, the most one of the most important points here really i would say was in terms of vocabulary okay and the the attempt for a rise of a standard english see the our dates what were our dates our dates were 1150 to 1500 okay this just the beginning of the 16th century now before you know the end of middle english we find the tendency for the rise of standard english of a certain standard of english before this you remember there were dialects right we talked about northern dialect uh, east midland dialect etc okay now there were different dialects but there there was okay a time came when there was we, we see the phenomenon of the rise of a standard english now let's read from uh, i think this is bo by the end of the 14th century a language emerged in the written form that varied with the local dialects this was recognized as the standard language both in speech and writing and was called london english or east midland dialect geographically it occupied a middle region owing to its name this region was also the largest and the most populous and prosperous district in the country we have to understand this was really the beginning of mercantile capitalism this this was a, was you know um, by this time trade right trade and mercantilism okay these were some of the very important cultural attributes of the time okay so because of that also you need a standard english for people to to have agreements for people to uh, you know talk about trade to people for people to uh, you know uh, to agree on 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 uh, so many aspects as far as business was concerned do you understand and also as the reading public grew as you said see with the coming of the printing press in england there are many factors and find this in the lecture in early modern english how you know there are several factors like the spread of popular education etc which came and gave rise to a standard english now the importance of london english as boss says here was that by far the most influential factor in the rise of standard english was the importance of 
London as the capital of England. London English took as well as gave. It began as a southern and ended as a midland dialect. The London standard had been ex accepted in most parts of the country in writing in the latter part of the 15th century. So, this is again another important, uh, important phenomenon in, um, in, uh, middle in the middle English period of the English language. Okay? Then, however, Bohr also uh, cautions us, you know he says for instance, let me, let me read from his text, it would be a mistake to think that complete uniformity was attained okay, within the space of a few generations, even though there was the rise of standard English. Even in matters of vocabulary, dialectical differences have persisted in cultivated speech down to the present day and they were no less noticeable in the period during which London English was gaining general acceptance. Okay. So, it is a rise of standard English is a or rise of a standard form in any language okay, obviously is, uh, is a discernible phenomenon, okay. but any scholar of the history of English language would also readily agree that this, um, you know, this so called standard okay, uh, was there all right, but there were also many other variants that were that continued to be spoken by the people okay, in which for instance he says even to the present day okay, we have uh, you know in fact today it is said that we you know say the BBC English is uh, you know uh, the BBC English was able to really in the more modern times standardize okay, standardize English because that is the English everybody was listening to when there was a radio right. So, everybody would listen to a certain variant or certain kind if I may use the word certain kind of English and then they would also be encouraged, you would feel encouraged because it was a standard quote unquote standard, it was the broadcasted language. Okay. So, people would begin to, to learn those words, learn, learn even how to speak, learn what kind of things to avoid, okay. learn also uh, you know the words, okay, get the repertoire of, of words growing. Okay. So, there was broad Again, as I said, if you look at the cultural changes, histor socio historical changes, you will find that the media also is a means of standardization, of standardizing things. And it also happened in the modern times, okay. we find that, as I said, the, uh, the BBC was um, instrumental willy nilly okay, of giving rise to a standard version of English. You follow? Okay. Now, we will slowly find that they are now changing conditions okay, up to the modern period and here we find that in the early modern period which is our next, next uh, historical period, uh, we find these factors okay, the coming of the printing press and popular education the, with increased communication and increased social consciousness. Now, these are all related I will want you to look at this very carefully. Okay. See here is a technological matter let us call this a material technological fact the coming in of the printing press. Now, what happens when there is a printing press? When there is a printing press, they, the book the you know uh, reading material okay, or text which were hitherto in manuscript form and very limited okay, may be just a few copies through copying from the main manuscript. This changed the entire this scenario was completely changed. So, you could have say as A C Boss says you could have 100,000 books published okay, by the printing press which was available okay, to more than 100,000 people okay, with the growing of lending libraries for instance or personal lending. Okay. We uh, people could actually get copies right, and read them. Now, what happens is this also gives an impetus to popular education the availability of text. Okay. Why not? The rise of schools of course, this is the thing point that may have come to your mind, the rise in the number of schools, okay. the rise in popular education, people reading uh, uh, not uh, for you know for any specialization purposes, but people reading you know uh, reading um, text written poetry for instance, okay. reading prose for instance for even for just leisure and pleasure. Right? So, the printing press therefore, made available. Um, books in uh, you know uh, in the in the english language which would then establish the language in a way it was never established before now see in the if the modern pa counterpart was the bbc and even after that if the counterpart is in, uh, the internet okay during 
the transition from Middle English to Early Modern English, the Early Modern English which is the next period in our uh, you know um, division of the way we have divided is generally divided the history of English language, we will find that this is a very important phenomenon. So, a technological phenomenon leads to a cultural phenomenon which is the growth of popular education, it is increased communication and finally, it gives makes an impact or it has an impact on social consciousness in general. Okay. Ideas now okay. ideas now come to be shared by people, the social consciousness is changed right, the, the you know the general at more the general knowledge atmosphere has changed ok. Even I would say the general ideological atmosphere changes, because it also matters what kind of books are published. Do you follow? What kind of texts are chosen to be published that also leads to a change in the social consciousness of people. So, remember this is an extremely important time as far as the English language is concerned and as we say as we found that there was a rise uh, you know um, of a standard form of English finally, zooming into the East Midland dialect that was there among the four dialects. Uh, it was important that London slowly uh, came to be you know uh, the capital and the business capital, the business centre okay. and there was need there was a need also by the tradesman class by the mercantile class for uh, for further for, for more education do you understand. Okay. So, these are you see some of uh, uh, the social te technological uh, historical political changes that also lead determine the course uh, of a language. Now, Bo again is he Bo? Uh, mentions this here. He says the majority of the texts it is true were in Latin, whereas it is in the modern languages that the effect of the printing press was chiefly to be felt. In England over 20,000 titles in English had appeared by 1640 that is the middle of the 17th century. The result was what this result was to bring in to bring books which had formerly been the expensive luxury of the few within the reach of all. Okay, so, there was a sort of we may use the word a democratization of the reading uh, the of reading accessibility okay, the of the uh, accessibility of books of reading or I would say the democratization of the reading opportunity right. So, the A C boss says the result was to bring books which had formerly been the expensive luxury of the few within the reach of all. It was possible to reproduce a book in a thousand copies or a hundred thousand every one exactly like the other okay. a powerful force thus existed for promoting a standard uniform language again a standard uniform language is possible precisely because of the availability of books in print okay, during that particular period in history. Then we will now move on to the next um, period which is uh, modern English. Modern English really is uh, you know uh, divided into two, two parts that is early modern English and late modern English. Now, many scholars call it uh, uh, call the first early modern English and the second they do not use the word late they simply call it modern English. Okay. Modern English is again not homogeneous over time. Okay. The modern English that was uh, there say 200 years ago is not the English that we have today, since language is extremely dynamic and the English language in particular okay, among some other languages is also a very dynamic language, it has been able to, uh, to give as well as take as it were. Okay. So, when we uh, uh, come to the modern period is one, one thing that I would like to highlight here okay, among other things and which is uh, the enormous growth of vocabulary right, in uh, as far as the modern times are concerned. Right. And this enormous growth in vocabulary may be traced to back to historically to uh, two important social historical, historical factors. First is the industrial revolution, okay, the coming of industrial revolution and the second is the growth of the British empire. So, we need to talk about the you know the, um, the enormous sort of impact these two things had okay, on the growth of vocabulary. Right. right? So, the uh, uh, we will end with the modern period and also a bit about you know uh, about science etcetera okay. and let us first begin with what happened okay, in uh, you know because of these two historical 
um, uh, events or series of events which is uh, the industrial revolution and the rise of the British empire. So, these are the two points industrial revolution and the empire. Okay. So, this uh, the growth of science from the 17th century from Newtonian science okay, and the growth of technology during the uh, industrial revolution for instance the spinning jenny um, you are all okay, acquainted with this with the from your social studies classes the spinning jenny then uh, the steam engine for instance. They gave rise to new materials definitely new machines right new means and, and uh, improved means of transportation and communication communication and new systems of manufacture now these remember these you will agree that these are relatively very new things you had materials like never before okay with the coming of science and technology in uh, follow after with Newton okay, the, some people also call the coming of the modern age. Okay. Machines new kinds of machines were there which never existed before okay. new means and improved means of transportation and new manufacturing industries. Things were at least that were not manufactured in the old artisan uh, industry. Uh, of or way of manufacturing things. So, this necessi necessitates the growth of vocabulary you needs need you need words okay, in order to name at least you name these things and largely what happened is uh, the new words came you know uh, there was sort of a, a leaning okay, if I may use the word leaning on to uh, onto antiquity on to uh, roots etymologically coming from Latin and Greek. We know you all of you know are aware you have also done learn this in your school okay, about the renaissance a time of great learning of revival okay, in England where the classics were re, uh, you know uh, there was a renewed interest not only among literary scholars but also among scientists. Scientists too took a great interest in uh, uh, you know in antiquity in Latin and Greek texts not on not for the science okay, precisely because of the great literatures that came from those times. So, as we see here the new products for instance the new products machines and processes the new there were new words for instance like train, engine, reservoir, pulley, combustion, piston, hydraulic condens condenser electricity, telephone, telegraph, lithograph, camera, vacuum, cylinder, apparatus, pump, siphon, locomotive, factory. Some of these may uh, also have originated later uh, you know the, in, in the new world okay, in, in, in America, but the point is here this slide shows us that new products, new machines will need new names. Okay. So, these are some of the new additions to the vocabulary among thousands and thousands of words. So, oh, next when we talk about modern English we cannot leave out the phenomenon of the growth of a type of English a variety of English in America in the new world. Okay. Now, with the coming of the pilgrim fathers um, in the 17th century we had the slow uh, slowly uh, the rise of a variant of English known as American English. Okay. So, American English was the English that was established in uh, in the new world okay, following uh, the conquest of the new world by the English. Right? So, for instance they were again native remember we had said that languages both take and give. So, it is not that one, one uh, part or say one uh, territory is conquered by some, uh, some, uh, uh, some other country and that the, the territory in question only takes, but they the, the uh, conquering country okay, also takes in words from uh, the, the, the from the country they have annexed or con conquered. Okay. So, we have from the native Americans we have words for instance of animals like raccoon, opossum, moose, chipmunk, skunk and also for instance tomato the word tomato is of native American origin which was taken into the English language. Uh, there was as we find in this interesting quotation from Thomas Jefferson in 1813, there was the new he says the new circumstances under which we are placed call for new words, new phrases 
and for the transfer of old words to new objects. And then he says an American dialect will therefore, be formed. He obviously does not call it an American language, he calls it an American dialect. The, and a, a most important figure in this overview of you know in the English language, the history of English language here we cannot do without is Noah Webster as far as the American English is concerned. Um, Webster as you are you are, all of you are familiar with the fact that there is a Webster's dictionary of English of the English language and Webster said. So, there was through Webster uh, the attempt and a successful one okay, of pruning words right. They are not new words, but these are words uh, from the mother country so to speak okay, that are pruned simply because letters are not seem to be necessary here. And all of you are, are um, you know uh, familiar with this for instance theatre for T H E A T R E we have theatre and instead of center from the uh, old C E N T R E we have C E N T E R okay, color, honor, traveler, jeweler, check instead of C H E Q U E we have check and same for mask okay, plow P L O W for P L O U G H. So, there was among other things Noah Webster tried to prune the you know the existing English English words and to make them more streamlined as he thought them to be. Therefore, English in the scientific age, if we say the modern age is a scientific age, English in the scientific age therefore, sees certain standardization and codification. Okay. For instance, there was there is also the variant of public school English. Okay. There was a new scientific vocabulary, changes in pronunciation, the influence of scientific writing, new words for you know that were necessary for the scientific enterprise in a way in which uh, it far uh, sort of uh, you know went far far beyond in number uh, uh, you know than the, the, the previous systems of use of words in the scientific domain was concerned. Okay. So, science was a very important factor as I said science and empire, science and technology in the industrial revolution and empire these are the important socio historical factors. Today we find that culture industries English is also okay, determine the kind of English we use today and the new words for instance new usages that, that come to us also come from the press from advertising, okay, from communication industries, transport and communication, from broadcasting. Okay, we gave the example of the BBC, uh, from broadcasting, from from television. Uh, you can name it from soaps, from documentaries, okay, from National Geographic, etc., from sound recording, and also motion pictures. These are also, uh, you know, ways through which changes in the language come in. Then we will end here now and uh, there are some of the things which we obviously could not discuss here and uh, especially from uh, English in India. So, let us leave it for uh, you know the last uh, lecture in this course we will talk about it in detail. So, the say if you ask a question like what should the English the study of uh, you know, a study of his, the history of say any language say particularly the English language. Um, focus on the one of the ways you will say that one of the ways to focus is not on is not to study changes because history means change. Okay. You look at the history of something because it is a dynamic process. Now, it is not just chronicling. Okay. It is a historian is different from a chronicler. A chronicler will give you dates and that is why here I have not really talked so, so much about dates really. Okay. Will chronicler will give you dates and their events. But a historian is going to look at a far more holistic picture of changes say in the case of language in relation to as I said in the beginning relation to changes in technology, changes in science, changes in society, okay, changes in political processes. Do you follow? Okay, for instance, empire is something that we found was very growth of the British empire was very important or had imp important implications for the English language. Okay. So, we you say that we will write that we will we the growth development and history of a language needs to be seen from a historian's point of view not a chronicler's point of view. Second say if you ask the question like what are the ma major phases of English the history of the English language and you say that the, there are four major periods okay, of the history of the English language namely old English, middle English. Okay. Remember old English 
with the coming of the Anglo uh, uh, Anglo Saxons and Jutes and Middle English after the Norman conquest, okay. Then early modern English and modern English, these are okay. And after that, you can say safely that we talk about world Englishes, right? That is uh, more in a horizontal, uh, not in a linear fashion, so more in a ho distributed horizontal fashion of understanding varieties of English. Do you follow? Okay. Then now the third question would be on how the question like how did a standard form of English emanate. Okay. Then you would have to talk about the London dialect, you talk about the rise of the tradesman class, you have to mention the printing press for instance, the spread of education, rise of popular education, the rise of in the number of schools for instance. Okay. So, this is one of the fir first times when there was a standard rise of a definite standard English. Right. And finally, we we'll talk about uh, modern times, we we'll talk about uh, you know if you ask the question like name two important uh, events or, or series of events in modern English history that had great impact on particularly the vocabulary of English of modern English. Then you need to mention the two which are what the industrial revolution and the growth of the British empire. Okay. And, uh, um, I have not talked so much about literature here, because we talk about literature in the next um, module, which will be dealt with by, uh, we will find, uh, find lectures by my colleague Professor Krishna Borra. This, this was largely or this was actually only on the English language. So, I have not really talked, I have not talked about Chaucer here, I have not talked about Shakespeare here, I have not talk, talked about uh, Bernard Shaw here for instance. Okay. So, I am, uh, uh, because of paucity of time, I am simply giving you a uh, you know a collection of lectures on the history of the English language relating it to socio cultural political changes. Uh, thank you so much, we will meet in the next lecture, we will begin to talk about old English in more detail. Thank you.